Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Denowitz. Um, I'm one of the suicide prevention coordinators um, here with the Central Texas VA in Austin, Texas. Um, on the call as well, I also have my um, counterpart, um, Simon Parker. He's one of the other suicide prevention coordinators with us here at the Austin VA. Um, I just need to pull up the PowerPoint. We'll kind of get folks rocking and rolling here shortly. So um, the, what we're going to go over this morning is the VA SAFE training. It's a training that we provide to both um, staff within the VA as well as staff out in the community. Um, so before we begin, um, you know, suicide is an intense topic for some people. And so we're going to be talking about ways in which everyone can contribute to a safer environment for veterans at risk for suicide. Um, we do understand that this is a sensitive topic and that people in attendance today may have had personal experience involving suicide. Um, if you do find that you need to take a break, please do so. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at the end of the presentation if you feel like you need some additional support. Um, if you feel like you need to talk with someone at any time, you can call, also contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Service members and veterans should press one to connect to the veteran um, uh, side of the crisis line. This is a great number um, to have stored in your phone, whether it's your cell phone or um, in a pocketbook, a wallet phone. Um, it's something that I have stored both in my personal cell phone as well as my work cell phone. It's a good number to pass out. As I mentioned, the 1-800 number is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's the press one prompt that will direct folks over um, to the Veterans Crisis Line. So just an overview of some objectives. So this program is focused on preventing suicide attempts and saving lives that otherwise might be lost by suicide. And so it's designed to train everyone who knows a veteran or themselves are a veteran to be a gatekeeper. The role of gatekeepers co is connecting those at risk for suicide with people who can help them. You can save lives by being sensitive to people in distress and by connecting them with care. So, you know, we're gonna, in the beginning, go over some facts about veteran suicide, talk about some common myths versus realities, go through the VA's um, save steps, and then last but not least, we'll go over um, some resources. At the end of the presentation, we'll also have some time for questions where folks can chime in and um, if they need any clarification or just, you know, want to ask a general question, you're welcome to um, uh, reach out at the end of the presentation. So the objectives of this uh, presentation here is um, one, to give yourself a general understanding of the scope of veteran suicide within the United States, know how to identify um, a veteran or non-veteran who may be at risk for suicide, and know what to do if you identify a veteran at risk. Some facts about suicide. So suicide is a national issue with rising rates of suicide in the general population. In addition, suicide rates are higher and are rising faster among veterans than among non-veteran adults. Um, societal factors such as economic disparities, race, ethnicity, LGBTQ disparities, homelessness, social connection and isolation, and health and well-being play uh, additional roles into suicide, um, especially within the coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic. Um, it's also placed additional strain on our nation and on individuals and communities. Um, and so this all is to say that it's a national public health problem and that um, both the VA and uh, non-VA worlds are actively uh, working on conducting research about suicide with the goal of prevention, um, conducting outreach and education to community members, again, talking about you know things like warning signs, how to identify somebody who may be at risk so that we can um, work towards expediting and encouraging help. We do know with research that for every death by suicide, approximately 135 individuals are impacted. And as I mentioned, you know, there's many factors that um, are generally at play, and it is that sole reason that makes suicide such a complex issue, and that there's no specific one, like single cause um, 
that results in somebody engaging in suicidal behavior. And often, in fact, it's a result of complex interaction of both risk and protective factors at the individual, community, and societal levels. Risk factors are those characteristics that are associated with an increased likelihood of suicidal behaviors. Now, it doesn't mean that they cause suicide or that even if somebody has these factors, that that means that they're going to then get engage in suicidal behavior, but they are indicators that it puts somebody at an elevated risk. Whereas protective factors, these are things that can help offset um, risk factors and things that we're trying to maximize and boost um, while reducing, you know, the other side of things, those risk factors um, at all levels throughout communities nationwide. So some examples of risk factors and protective factors. Um, so risk factors, uh, having a history of maybe a pri prior suicide attempt, mental health issues, depression, PTSD, anxiety, substance use issues, um, access to lethal means, having a recent loss, maybe some financial legal challenges, relationship problems, unemployment, uh, homelessness. Whereas protective factors, again, these are the things that we're trying to boost and maximize. So things like having access to mental health care, having a sense of connectedness to family, friends, their community, um, having problem solving skills. So, you know, as problems and issues occur, you know, having that skill set to be able to navigate the, um, those issues, having a sense of spirituality, uh, feeling like you have a mission or purpose in life, um, having good physical health being employed, and then having social and emotional well-being. And as I mentioned, our goal is to try to reduce those risk factors and boost protective factors. So when we're looking at risk factors and protective factors, we're trying to see, okay, which of those can we maybe resolve? So for example, if somebody is maybe unemployed or experiencing homelessness or financial um, strain, you know, what resources can we help, you know, get them connected with, you know, here in the VA, maybe that's getting them connected um, with some emergency financial assistance that can help pay rent and utilities. Maybe that's getting them connected with our um, healthcare for homeless veterans program or a referral to um, one of the organizations we work in the community with that helps with employment. Um, you know, whereas on protective factors, you know, if they're working already with mental health services, maybe it's increasing those mental health visits, um, you know, getting them connected to the VA chaplain for additional support where, you know, they can um, explore more of like their spirituality and their relationship uh, with whichever religion that they identify with, um, including friends, family members, people that they trust within their support network. Um, these are just some, you know, examples of the different things that we look at. Um, so every year annually, the VA um, conducts a um, they conduct extensive research and produce um, an annual report um, that breaks down the findings from the previous year in relation of veteran suicidal deaths, behaviors, um, lethal means, all of that kinds of stuff. It's a pretty lengthy report. If y'all are interested in that information, I can definitely send out the link in order to access that. But the next few slides, we're gonna um, kind of talk about some of the key findings. So we know that, you know, again, you know, suicide among veterans is something that's occurring. Um, we know based on the data that between 2001 and as you can see here, 2017, 2018, um, veteran suicide deaths were on the rise, um, and that, you know, most recently in 2019, uh, there's actually been a reduction. And so when we look at 2001, we see that veterans accounted for 5,989 suicides in 2001, which represented about 20.2% of suicides among U.S. adults in 2001 versus in 2019, there was 6,261 suicides, which by comparison represented about 13.7% of suicides among U.S. adults in 2019. Um, when looking at 2019 compared to 2018, we did um, find that 399 uh, fewer veterans died um, by suicide in 2019 than 2018. And our goal is with you know, education and intervention is to see this number continue to be decreased. 
Looking at age and sex adjusted suicide rates among veterans and non veteran adults from 2001 and 2019, um, you can see again that there was some steadily steady rise, but then, you know, from 2018 to 2019, um, there's actually been a decrease. And we see that that adjusted suicide rate decrease among veterans um, at 7.2%, um, and then exceeded four times by the non-veteran population of a decrease of 1.8. Um, and that this was um, larger than any observed for veterans from 2001 to 2019. So if you look at this graph here, you see that, you know, there's been some slight, you know, adjustments both up and down, but really from that 2018 to 2019 is where you see that um, sharp decline. Um, so again, looking more at age-adjusted uh, suicide rates per 100,000, both between male and female veterans. So in 2019, the adjusted suicide rates were 152% greater for veteran men than veteran women. Um, rates for veteran men were the highest in 2018 and then fell 3.8% um, in 2019 versus um, with the female veterans, um, the highest rate was in 2019 and then fell in 2018 and again in 2019, which represented a 14.9 decrease relative to 2018. Uh, other big things that we look at within like the data is uh, looking at you know the suicide deaths and the methods that were involved. Um, as we can see here, just kind of looking across the board um, within uh, both just the general population, and even when you look at the breakdown between uh, men and women, uh, men and women veterans, we see that firearms um, was the majority of the method used compared to the other methods listed here, including poisoning, suffocation, and other. Um, specifically, firearms accounted for 70.2% of male veteran suicides in 2019, which was up from 69.6% in 2019, and 49.8% of female veteran suicides in 2019, uh, which was up from 41.1%. Um, this is important because one of the big things, you know, we know that among the veteran population, being here in Texas, you know, things like firearms are popular. Uh, people have firearms for a wide variety of reasons, whether it's recreational use, sport, folks go hunting, they collect them, you know, protection. Um, we know that people just have firearms. Now, we're not here um, to tell folks that you must get rid of your firearms. Uh, more than anything, you know, we want to talk about lethal means safety. Um, so what is lethal means safety? So in the context of suicide prevention, lethal means safety is safe storage of uh, lethal means, which essentially is any sort of action that can build uh, time and space between when that individual maybe has um, a suicidal impulse and their ability to harm oneself. Um, lethal means safety can be applicable to any, you know, lethal means that the person has considered. So if somebody has considered or has access to firearms, it would be using things like trigger locks, cable gun locks, you know, a gun safe, storing the ammunition separate from the, the firearm, um, medications, you know, removing any excess or expired medications, securing them in a medication lockbox. You know, if they've um, considered other means, again, you know, removing those, those means and creating that time and space. It's important that when we're, you know, engaging conversations about lethal means, that it's a collaborative um, approach and that it's veteran centric. So, as I mentioned, we're not here to tell, you know, folks what they should or should not do um, with like their firearms or other means that they have access to. Um, rather, we want to engage them in a conversation that respects their values and priorities while also, you know, um, keeping them safe. So. Um, just kind of engaging that conversation to see, you know, what works for them. You know, some people I've talked to have said, you know, um, securing my firearm, like that's not an option. I have it for protection, um, you know, but I do have it, you know, placed, you know, in an accessible but not quickly accessible location. And that's like the best I can do. Um, some people it's like, you know, I don't have a, a gun lock, but that's something that I would be interested in. And so within our program in suicide prevention, uh, we may mail out or pass out gun locks. Again, it's, you know, 
veteran centric, meaning it's you know, tailored to that individual, what they feel comfortable with, what aligns with their values and priorities. We're not here to tell people what they should or should not do. Um, legal means is important because we know that again, creating that time and space is um, super important in terms of helping save, um, save lives. Um, there's been extensive research that has studied lethal means safety. Um, and in fact, there was a study that found that 47% of individuals who experienced a suicidal crisis said that it took less than one hour between their decision to attempt suicide and their actual attempt. Whereas 24% of folks um, said that it took less than five minutes for them to act. And so the time between when a person decides to die by suicide and they act on the decision is often very short. And in fact, a 2005 study found that 71% of attempters estimating that the process took less than an hour. And so this reality really underscores the importance of reducing access for means for those who are at an elevated risk for suicide until that risk period passes. So sometimes some people, for example, you know, they just have a lot of different things going on. They had a loss of a family member. They lost their job. They're concerned about, you know, paying their bills. Maybe they have some legal issues going on. You know, they've had an increase in depression, anxiety, some other mental health symptoms. And so, you know, for a temporary period, maybe they have their neighbor or, you know, a church member, somebody they trust, secure their firearms. And then after that time passes, you know, a couple months or so, they, they're then at a better place. They're connected with mental health services. You know, they've processed, you know, the, um, the loss. They got a new job. Um, they may then say, okay, you know, I'm at, I'm at a better place. You know, I feel more comfortable having the firearms back in my home. And then they return them. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that having access to lethal means increases suicide risk for everyone living in the home, um, which is, again, why lethal means safety is so important. Um, the acute phase of a suicidal crisis, as mentioned, is often brief. And so building time and space, even 30 to 60 minutes between when they have that impulse to act and the means to harm themselves um, saves lives. Um, Research has also shown that we know that people rarely substitute one means for another, so it's important to restrict whichever means they have in mind. And this uh, point is underscored even more by when we look at these um, triangles here. Um, so we, we do see here that, you know, in terms of like firearm injury, that it accounts for 85 to 90 percent of fatal suicides, whereas all other methods combined is 5%. And so when we're when we're considering lethal means again, we're looking at those means that that individual has considered to use to potentially harm themselves and creating that time in that space. Um, and so again, lethal means safety works. Um, this is, you know, the one of the things that we preach fairly regularly within the VA is, you know, again, reducing that access is one of the few population level interventions that has been really shown to decrease suicide rates. And in fact, about 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not go on to die by suicide. And so we want to be collaborative with veterans, with people in our lives ahead of time to help them survive a suicidal crisis. Um, because when we do that, we've likely prevented suicide for the rest of their lives. As, as we know, suicide is preventable and preventative treatment works and everyday people across the nation reach out for support and are able to live healthy, productive lives. So now we're gonna talk about some common myths versus realities. And so even though suicide is a major public health concern, there are a lot of common myths and misinformation about suicide. So let's talk about some of those because having accurate information about suicide makes it easier to reach out to others and help them. One common myth is that people who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. What we know is the reality is that no matter how casually or jokingly said, suicide threats should never be ignored and may indicate serious suicidal feelings. And so someone who talks about suicide is providing others with an opportunity to intervene before suicidal behavior occurs. Another common myth is that the only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. 
In fact, special training is not required to safely raise the subject of suicide. Helping someone feel included and showing genuine, heartfelt support can also make a big difference during a challenging time. Um, and this is again the, a big one, a big one of the myths that we like to, you know, really um, stress along with another one. And we don't have it on this PowerPoint slide, um, but another common myth is that you can, um, but asking and talking about suicide, you can plant the thought in somebody's mind. That is also a reality. Um, rather asking the most in question of all, which we'll talk here shortly in terms of the VA save steps, um, creates the opportunity for that person to be open and honest about maybe some of the different things that they've been struggling with um, and allows you to kind of meet that person where they're at and help ex expedite and encourage help. When looking at this, uh, VA safe steps. Um, again, this is to help you act with care and compassion if you encounter a veteran or even a non-veteran who's in a suicidal crisis. So when we're looking at um, the steps of save, we're looking at those signs of suicidal thinking that should be recognized, knowing how to ask the most important question of all, validating the individual's experience, and encouraging treatment and expediting help. So let's break each of these down a little bit further. So when looking at signs of suicidal thinking, we're you know wanting to learn to recognize these warning signs. So um, things like hopelessness, feeling like there's no way out, feeling anxious, agitated, maybe um, having poor sleep, you know, trouble falling asleep or maintaining sleep, struggling with mood swings, uh, feeling like there's no reason to live, rage, anger, engaging in risky activities without thinking increasing substance use, both alcohol and drug use, and withdrawing from family and friends. Now, these are not, you know, again, you know, like indicators that require immediate attention, rather things that we should be paying attention to um, because they're warning us that, you know, somebody may, you know, be having um, suicidal thoughts. Whereas the presence of any of these following signs, these are where um, immediate attention should be um, sought. So thoughts about hurting themselves, looking for ways to die, talking about death, dying, or suicide, engaging in self-destructive or risk-taking behavior, especially when it involves alcohol, drugs, or weapons. So again, the presence of any of these signs, that's where immediate medical attention should be sought. So A is going to be asking and knowing how to ask the most a question, most important question of all, which is, are you here thinking about killing yourself? Now, it's important that we use this specific verbiage because, you know, if we're asking folks like, are you having thoughts about wanting to hurt yourself? Um, that allows room for folks to interpret, you know, hurt themselves to be different. Somebody could think, oh, well, you know, maybe I have a history of, um, non-suicidal self-harm behavior like cutting or injuring myself in other ways. Well, yes, I'm having those thoughts, but no, I'm not doing that with the intention of actually killing myself. Um, using this specific language um, reduces, you know, interpretation error by somebody else because it's very specific. Are you having thoughts about killing yourself? And asking the question, you know, do ask the question if you've identified some of those warning signs or symptoms that we've talked about. Rather, don't ask the question as though you're looking for an, a no answer. An example being, you aren't thinking of killing yourself, are you? Um, do ask the question in a natural way that kind of flows with your, your conversation. Um, and don't ask the question when someone's halfway out the door. You know, if they're already walking out the house and down the driveway to get into their car, that's not really the appropriate time to ask that question. Rather, that question should have asked before they were, you know, halfway um, out the door. Um, you know, ask a direct question if you identify those warning signs. Again, you know, increase in risky behavior, um, you know, them mentioning thinking of, you know, suicide, um, you know, and however, and again, asking that question, however it flows in your conversation, you know, and so it could be thing, something like, you know, I want to better understand what you mean by ending it all. You know, are you thinking about killing yourself? Um, you want to phrase questions in a way that indicates openness 
to listening and remaining non-judgmental no matter the answer. Um, this is extremely important as it will help the veteran or individual understand that people are willing to listen. And again, the question shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be asked promptly when someone indicates that they may be at risk for suicide. Um, there may not be an optimal time to ask the question and doing so may be discomforting. Um, but it's important that despite this discomfort that we ask that question anyway. I can tell you the more we get used to having those open, challenging conversations like suicide, the easier it does get. So when looking at V, validating the veteran's experience, again, we want to talk openly about suicide and be willing to listen and allow the individual to express his or her feelings. We want to also recognize that the situation is serious and not pass judgment and reassure the individual that help is available. E, encouraging treatment and expediting getting help. So what should you do if you think someone is suicidal? So the big thing is, is don't keep it secret. Um, no, no keeping secrets whatsoever. If someone says that they'll talk to you about an issue only if you promise not to tell anyone, it's important to be upfront and saying that you can't make that promise because you care about them and want to get any help that they may need. You don't want to keep a secret and then regret it. The other thing is you don't want to leave that individual alone. You want to try to get them to seek immediate help from his or her doctor or the nearest hospital emergency room. And if needed, call 911. And again, reassuring the veteran that help is available and reaching out to the veteran's crisis line, which as I mentioned earlier is 1-800-273-8255 and press one at the front. When talking with an individual who's at risk for suicide, it's important that you remain calm, that you listen more than you speak, maintain eye contact, act with confidence, don't argue with the individual, use open body language. Open body language signals interest to the other person and in the conversation. And so if you can maintain a relaxed posture, lean in closer, use direct eye contact and not in agreement to show the individual that you're present in the moment with them. You also want to limit questions. Let the individual do the talking and use supportive and encouraging statements and be honest. You know, let them know that there's no quick solutions, but help is available. If you're on the phone with someone and they express suicidal ideation, you want to keep the caller on the line. Don't hang up or transfer. Um, you want to remain calm, obtain any identifying information on the caller, so their name, phone number, current location. Um, you can do a conference call to the Veterans Crisis Line. Again, don't hang up until the responder has the call. Um, this comment here about enlisting coworkers for assistance via instant messaging on Teams, this is something that we use within internally within the VA. Um, but I know other organizations who also use Microsoft Teams or um, other chat systems, um, that's another thing that they can use. If the caller disconnects, you want to also call them back immediately. And if no answer, dial 911 in the crisis line. Again, remembering the steps of SAVE, it's those signs of suicidal thinking that should be recognized, asking the most important question of all, validating the veteran's experience experience and encouraging treatment and expediting help. So now we're going to talk about some resources that are um, available for, you know, all veterans and individuals. So again, the big one is the Veterans Crisis Line. It connects veterans in crisis and their families and friends with a qualified, caring VA responder through a confidential toll-free hotline, online chat, or text. Veterans and their loved ones can call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 at the prompt. Um, they can chat online or send a text message to 838-255 to receive confidential crisis intervention and support 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. When looking at the crisis line, it was initially founded in 2007. By 2009 is when the online chat was launched. And in 2011 is when they started um, the text option. Um, as we can see here, um, by 2016 and 2018, they opened their second and third call centers and incre increased the number of staff who are responding to these crisis line calls and also started the Caring Letters program. 
Um, in total, more than 5.6 million calls um, have been made to the Veterans Crisis Line, more than 218,000 text messages, and more than 660,000 chats. And the Crisis Line responders have initiated more than 1 million referrals to the local suicide prevention coordinators. When they do that, it um, sends the referral to the local teams. Um, so, for example, um, myself, Simon, and we have um, five other staff who are on our team across Central Texas. And so each of us rotate um, covering the follow-up calls from the crisis line. And the big thing with the crisis line is that they've also dispatched more than 204,000 um, welfare checks, you know, where emergency services are going out and attempting to locate the individual. Um, the veteranscrisisline.net, that is the main website for the crisis line, which allows folks to access the, the online chat. This website um, resource locator, um, this is a handy tool um, that we use all the time within suicide prevention where it allows folks to easily find VA resources in their area, which includes suicide prevention coordinators, crisis centers, VA medical centers, outpatient clinics, benefits administration offices, and vet centers. So this is a great tool where you can find um, all sorts of resources available um, through the VA nearest you. And this is again what that um, uh, website looks like where you'll see here you can kind of select which resource you're looking for, put in your zip code, um, and then it'll populate the information that you're looking at. Um, reach out. This is um, our current campaign that's rooted in the idea that during life changes, veterans can practice upstream mental well-being and get support, and in turn, supporters and stakeholders can be empowered to help veterans go through a life challenge or tough time. As we've mentioned, suicide is a national public health issue that affects all Americans, including veterans, their families, and their friends. And so the VA works to increase an understanding about veteran suicide prevention and the resources available to veterans and their supporters and the VA stakeholders and partners. And so this is our new um, awareness campaign that um, was launched this past September, um, which replaced our previous campaign, the Be There campaign. Um, it's a neat website when you go um, navigate to the website. Um, it allows folks to kind of um, select maybe some different areas that they've been struggling and having a hard time with, and then it provides them with some resources and information in response to those areas. Make the connection. Um, this is an online resource that connects veterans, their family members, and friends and other supporters with information and solutions to issues affecting their lives. Um, it has you know, a lot of great videos um, that talk about a variety of topics. Um, for folks, things like PTSD, depression, um, all sorts of things. It's a great resource for folks um, that we often will encourage folks to check out. Um, as mentioned, um, a big thing is uh, mean safety. And we know that practicing safe storage of firearms, medications, and other means is super important. We know nearly half of all veterans own a firearm and most veteran firearm owners are dedicated to firearm safety. Um, firearm injuries in the home can be prevented by making sure that firearms are unloaded, locked, and secured when not in use with the ammunition stored in a separate location. Um, Keepitsecure.net is a website where folks can learn um, more about the importance of firearm and other lethal means safety. Uh, within the VA, we have a bunch of these cable locks like you, you can see here uh, on this image. If that is something that folks are interested in or would like, uh, we can definitely get y'all connected with some. We also have other goodies too within the suicide prevention office that we can get coordinated to be dropped off that have um, information about the veterans crisis line. So we have some wallet cards. We have like the little silicone wrist bracelets, dog tag, keychains. Uh, drink koozies, stress balls, all kinds of stuff. So if that's something that y'all are interested in, we can definitely get you connected with it. We also have these pamphlets, again, talking about lethal means safety. Um, for those who are tech savvy, um, there are a bunch of different mental health mobile apps that folk can, folks can utilize. Um, as you can see here, things like CBT, mindfulness, PTSD coach, couples coach, insomnia coach, all kinds of good things. 
specifically about the PTSD Coach app, this is where folks can actually complete a safety plan within the application so that as they're kind of going out and about, they'll have digital access um, to that plan, um, which for some people they prefer versus carrying around a piece of paper, or maybe they don't have the capacity to always bring that paper safety plan with them. And so having a digital copy is, is easier. Coaching and Take Care, this is a hotline um, that's a national telephone service um, that aims to educate, support, and empower family members and friends who are seeking care services for veterans. And so if they're ever having a challenging time or not sure how to navigate something, um, they can always reach out to Coaching and to Care. It's free. Um, and in fact, I've, I've talked with a couple of family members who have found it very helpful, just getting that additional support and encouragement um, for helping connect, you know, the veteran in their lives uh, with additional support and services. Um, the Suicide Risk Man uh, Management Consultation Program. So this is a consultation service um, that's through the VA um, that's free. And in addition to consultation, they provide resources for any provider that's in the community or the VA serving veterans at risk for suicide. Um, it's just an email group where you can send them an email um, and about a case that you're working on and needing any maybe resources or consultation on, and then the group will respond back. Those pension service uh, resources, um, this is again another one that's available within the VA. They have um, a variety of different information, both for community providers, um, workplace, you know, videos, infographics, podcasts, all kinds of resources. Um, Postvention is a service that we provide within suicide prevention to those uh, veterans, families, um, and communities who are impacted by um, suicide. As mentioned, we know that, you know, on average, 135 people are impacted. And so this is another resource that's um, a great support. There are also some others in the, or in the community as well. Um, one of the big uh, ones is TAPS, a Tragedy Assistance uh, Prevention. I forget the, the whole acronym, but TAPS is a big one that also connects uh, veterans, families, friends, communities who have been impacted by suicide with additional support and resources. And then last but not least is um, Psych Armor. So Psych Armor has the VA safe training as well. Um, they've recently updated their video. I believe it's about 17 minutes where again goes over everything that we've talked about this morning. They also have a bunch of other um, courses um, and information. So it's another great resource to, ch um, to check out if you would like to watch again the 17 minute video or if there's you know other information you're seeking, Psych Armor is a great resource for that. Um, so now we've got time for questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Maggie. I, I think the easiest thing, if you got a question, I'll relay it over the microphone rather than trying to run around with the mic. Do we have questions? Anybody? So I take it that uh, last thing you showed, the uh, psych uh, armor thing, is where we can go to get a synopsis of the save and those things you talked about today? Okay, anybody else have a question? Yeah. Yes. Okay, all the phone numbers and, and things you gave us, how are we going to get those to write down? Is that on that website you talked about, or do you have pamphlets that have that on it, or how does that work? Um, in terms of, like, the crisis line? <clears throat> Just you, you throw a, threw a bunch of resources up there with phone numbers, and how yeah. do we get those? Yeah, so um, if I'd say there's a couple ways I can do it. I can put it together, um, like, on, like, a little cheat sheet, and I can, like, Make copies and send that over to y'all, um, or I can email it out and then you kind of disperse to the the group. I can also send the PowerPoint slides um, if folks would like want that as reference as well. Um, if, you, if you could make a sheet that has the critical numbers on it yeah. and send it to me, I can make distribution on it. Absolutely. Do you have business card type things that you could send us copy of copies of? So we don't have any official um, business cards. I've been meaning honestly to get them ordered. I just haven't had time to, but I will include my contact information and everything on that sheet. Okay. Mike? You mentioned something about wallet cards with numbers on them. Is that something yeah, you can send over? Yeah. Uh, 
And see, I can send you an email, Dave, that lists all the different kind of priceless line goodies we have. And then if you want to just let me know what you have, we can arrange to get it dropped off. Okay, but you do have wallet cards, is that correct? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, say what you mean, Dan. Come I got you. I got you. Yes, yes. Other questions? Yes. Do you have data that would show how many of the suicides were Vietnam veterans? Um, specifically among uh, Vietnam veterans? I don't have the numbers specifically. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head if they break that down in the annual report. Um, but that's the annual report that they present. That gives all of the updated information regarding um, the data for suicides among the veteran population. Yeah, I would imagine that the current people coming out of the Gulf are the current high rates because of the increased. Yes, Sal. She showed the numbers were going down uh, up to uh, 20. From 18 to 19. Yeah. Yeah. How is it now? Do you have data? You showed numbers going down between 18 and 19. Is it still increase? Still continue to go down? Um, so the data for 2019 to 2019 is from the most recent report that they. Um, produced in 2021. Um, the data, the numbers are a little, I would say like a year or two behind just as they produce them. So this coming, um, I believe this coming winter, they should have an updated report that will, should reflect 2020, 2021. Okay, other, yes. Question was, has COVID had any impact on the decline of suicide? Uh, so in terms of COVID, we have noticed that it has, you know, resulted in an increase, um, you know, in a variety of different stressors, right? Either people, you know, who maybe were exposed to COVID and then had some physical health implications or maybe, you know, which is some of the different waxing and waning of the stages and, uh, folks having to quarantine and all that. Um, we've noticed, we have seen some impacts on folks' mental health, you know, with job loss or financial strain with COVID, you know, that has uh, resulted in some financial insecurity. Um, so over, I would say the past year or so, we've kind of noticed some upticks and declines in terms of like crisis line calls and folks being under stress. Uh, I can't say that COVID has specifically caused that per se, um, but we have noticed some trends in terms of like the impact that the pandemic has on folks in a wide variety of areas. Okay, thank you. Another question. Okay, Maggie, thank you so very much for your presentation. We've got a lot to think about. Uh, I want you to know that one of the primary purposes of our ministry here is the second point you made under the prevention, that is the supportive group. We are trying to build trusting, supportive, caring relationships so you've got an instant access to someone who cares and can listen. So thank you so much for your input. Absolutely, absolutely. And if y'all are ever interested in like connecting with like our chaplain service, I can also put in like contact with them as well. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, John, I guess we're done there. Okay, we're gonna now go into our breakouts. Uh, if you remember, there's been some, just a second. What's this? Okay, I thought it was that iron. I thought it was my fee for my honorarium. I'll put that in the kitty.